Catholic Martyrs of the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939, A Catholic Holocaust, by Fray Justo Perez de Urbel. Chapter 7 And Again Crucified. It is some months after the death of little Santiago. Our story now sadly moves to another location, Madrid, the joyful and naive city, perhaps our Babylon that now pays dearly for its shortcomings. It is very difficult to describe the situation in Red Madrid. The death of Don Jose Calvo Sotelo seemed to have unleashed a monster. Once free, its gory adventures reached equally monstrous proportions. At nightfall, Madrid was awash with shootings. Some far away out in the suburbs in lonely fields, Others nearby, in the very heart of the city, in its streets, in the asphalt center. Every shooting was a crime. It is unnecessary to paint the picture in greater detail. It was clear what sort of society it was and what principles it was based on. At this point in our story, our task becomes so difficult that only the obligation to present it keeps us going. Our purpose must be to ensure that such events never happen again. We must use all our resources, even our life, so that the replaying of these events be considered completely absurd. It must become incompatible in itself, as well as in ourselves. Born in Madrid, of a humble and irreproachable family, Father Martin Garcia was 27 years old, when the monster of which we were speaking was unloosed and Madrid was at its mercy. His heart full of ardor, permeated with the sole ambition of the love of God, he poured out his youth daily without tiring. It was a beautiful devotion. From seven in the morning when he officiated at the holy sacrifice of the Mass until nightfall, he dedicated his time to visiting and aiding the infirm and was truly a pure flame of Christ. When the militia appeared in the streets wielding their arms, Father Martin felt no obligation to flee or even to hide himself. He knew that while there was a single invalid who was in need of him, his place was at their side. Such reasoning was just too simplistic for those times. The very simple is, at times, so profound that it surpasses the norm. Father Martin, convinced that nothing could prevent him from carrying out his duties, continued his work from morning to night. His virtue and his scrupulous attention to all of the numerous occupations were admirable. His mass was almost angelic. The sublime moments of the consecration were, for him, superhuman felicity. Custom never staled for him. To cause God to descend into his hands was something so marvelous and such clear proof of God's love that he always felt anxiety that he might not know how to respond to such great generosity. His dedication to the children whose tender souls were open to his life was one of his favorite duties. And the children, conscious of this friendly devotion, ran to him like bees to a flower. We remember Father Martin well. One face among many can have its own peculiarities and idiosyncrasies, but what was special about Father Martin was not his face. It was his permanent air of sweetness, the evidence of a soul that sought perfection through love. Yes, we remember him well. A big man, energetic both by virtue of his youth and also through his determination. Never could any setback diminish the smile of this man completely submissive to the will of his creator. He loved to go out into the country with children and sitting on the grass, talk to them about Jesus and his mother. He passed on to them all he knew so that one day when they were grown up, it would be a clear memory capable of leading to salvation. He gave all he had. What others gave to him, he passed on to the poor, 
He wished to know poverty, separating himself from every treasure, even the most humble, except for the inexhaustible treasure of God. What greater possessions could there be? They came to Father Martin with an urgent request for an absolution. The dying penitent man lay in his bed, and Father Martin, on his knees, brought the infinite mercy of our Lord to his soul. Even apart from its religious nature, it was a moving scene. Even a dumb beast would be able to feel that something profound was taking place in that wretched room. Even a beast, we say, would feel it, but not, apparently, the militia. They raised Father Martin by blows. How many times have we come across this in our reports? We wish that the reader did not have to accustom himself to the word and even less to the fact. Without any investigation, simply from ill humor, one or several men began to beat another man. There was no question of any disputed prey. None of them had to save his own life at the expense of another's. In nature, even the beasts of the jungle need such reasons to turn against their own. It is frightening to think of it. To what frightful subversion of nature corresponds such a beating from the militia? As we say, they lifted him up with blows. The sick man they shot in the head. Good luck to you, said the monster. Dear God, exclaimed terrified Father Martin. Do you know what you've just done? Listen, deceiver. Your time is up for asking questions. Now you have to answer, and mind how you go. There were eight militia armed for war rather than assassination. Father Martin, shaken by that tremendous blow, with his suit stained with the blood pouring out from the victim, was on the point of collapse. It was too much. On the other hand, it had all occurred so quickly, so unexpectedly, that from a distance it seemed as if it might all be a nightmare. Unhappily, it was very real. They forced the priest to leave the house and get to the front of a truck. The militia got in the back. They arrived at the tribunal. It was one of many in operation and was conducted in one of the little side streets behind the Direccion General de Seguridad in the Puerta del Sol. To be on the safe side, they shut him up in a cell. He was there three days on bread and water, enduring the continual insults of the jailer. Through the jailer, he learned something terrible. The two serious charges being laid against him were, one, being a priest and a fascist spy, and two, killing a sick man. A militia entered the cell. He had a piece of paper in his hand with various names written on it. They're going to put you on trial, and while they are sorting out the procedure, you can get yourself ready. I have spent my whole life doing nothing else but prepare myself for death. As you wish, but enough nonsense for now. Here is a list of lawyers. Choose one. I don't know any of them. Then what do you want? Isn't it enough for you? If you don't know them, well, bad luck. Choose. You are going to kill me. I need no other defender but God. You can take my life, but not my mind. My innocence would survive any investigation intact. Have no doubt they are going to kill you. You're stubborn, like all the priests. That was the dialogue. It would indeed be a coincidence if anything remotely resembling normal legal procedure would be found there. The tribunal was formed of armed militia. Remarkable. The person performing the office of president spoke. This is not a normal trial. That much was clear. The comment was superfluous. Local people surprised the accused in the act of murdering an invalid. In wartime, there is no need of elaborate judicial procedure in such a case. On the other hand, the accused is a priest. 
sufficient reason to conclude he is a fascist with all that implies nevertheless he can defend himself the accused may speak i am a priest by the grace of god i have never done any harm to anyone did you not kill an invalid no how does the accused explain the large blood stain on his suit it is the blood of that man whose murder is so horrific that i prefer not to talk about it what was the accused doing in that house hearing the man's confession then who killed him father martin said nothing the accused must reply who killed him is it absolutely necessary that i reply if the accused does not reply we shall interpret his silence as admission of guilt as charged in that case i will answer it was a militia who arrested me and brought me here what proof can the accused produce in his defence let the accused bear in mind that he refused professional assistance the accused may proceed with his own defence let the reader put himself in father martin's position after he had been so wickedly arraigned and let him prepare his own defence you can imagine the scene of father martin's defence the accused in view of the charges laid against him and the fact that this tribunal is unconvinced by his defence will suffer the death penalty the fiction has ended he remained jail for five more days after which for unexplained reasons he was moved to an unknown village in the sierra at first nobody troubled him too much he ate badly and one day went hungry but such disasters were routine treatment at the hands of the reds father martin prayed intensely god consoled him to the extent that he was actually happy on one occasion he wrote a letter to his family without any hope that it would reach its destination but by good fortune it did those lines were a model dear parents and brothers i am in the power of the enemies of god in spain they accuse me of something i did not do something so horrible that i dare not tell it to you but the only reason for the hatred unleashed against me is by virtue of my being a priest i don't know when they are going to kill me i don't tell you this to sadden you i don't want you to cry to die a martyr's death is the greatest reward a catholic can receive imagine my joy as a minister of christ i forgive all those who have wronged me again i ask you not to lament my death see you in heaven and in fact they killed him three or four days after he had written that letter his martyrdom began after a ferocious beating they burdened him with a cross he went more than a mile and fell twenty-three times he was forced up by blows just before they arrived at the spot selected for his death they made a crown of thorns for him and fixed it on his head using the butts of their rifles they reached the foot of a hill father martin began to climb up but fell down exhausted the guards saw that he wouldn't make it he was at the end of his strength who would not collapse after such punishment so they helped him to raise a cross once they had reached the summit they tore off his clothes disfiguring his body then they crucified him in a final gesture of blasphemy after an hour he was dead they opened his stomach and finally they cut him up in quarters we have tried to reduce the narration to the basic essentials all the rest blasphemies abuse beatings throughout the martyrdom we leave to the reader's imagination the glory of that death needs no superfluous words what could have motivated the persecutors not only to accuse an innocent man of a terrible crime and then kill him but to do so in the manner of christ 
I tell you that the faith with blinding, frightening clarity shines through that appalling hatred. We commit no hypocrisy nor frivolity when we say that the more their rage overflowed, the more they sank into the blood of their victim, and the more intensely was God manifested in the midst of such horror. How could those men live out the rest of their days with consciences burdened with such terrifying crimes? Listen to what I am going to tell you now. A criminal from another province, not that in which Father Martin was crucified, confessed to having taken part in more than 200 murders, giving all the blood-curdling details and ending by begging forgiveness of his victims, their families, and of God. He rejected the hope that human justice might have given him in order to cleanse some part of his guilt by punishment. That unhappy fellow wrote a long and moving plea directed at the Spanish Reds, asking them fervently to convert to God our Lord and to repent. He listed all the arguments that had convinced him after such a life of crimes, sacrileges, thefts, and orgies, to see the existence of God and the truth of the Catholic faith of our fathers. We had to win the war. We had all the gold, all the industry, all the wealth, almost the whole nation, the masses and the army. The whole world was on our side. We exterminate the priests and the Catholics, and they win. I see clearly a superhuman and irresistible force that gave victory to the Catholics, whom we believed isolated and helpless. I believe in the greater strength of those Christians, and I ask forgiveness. Thus spoke a criminal converted in Barbastro prison. On the body of the 27-year-old Father Martin arose the new Spain with its peace and social order, with justice and religion. To renounce this peace and justice, even in small portions, is to betray the body of that martyr to renounce all the martyrs, to renounce what they stood for, what they achieved, that for which they gave their lives, would be an injustice that would weigh down our souls and have us crawling along all our lives under the weight of the burden.